Welcome to the Salem Poetry Project. If you want more information about the Salem Poetry Project, we have a Facebook page. Just type in Salem Poetry Project in Facebook. We should come right up at the top. We have readings every Thursday at 7 o'clock, and featured reader and an open mic. Bill Silverly was born and grew up in Lewiston, Ohio. I'm sorry, Idaho. And has lived in Portland since 1972. He holds a Master of Arts degree from San Francisco State University and has taught literature, composition, and creative writing in, at Portland Community College for 25 years. Bill has published five books of poems, Percival, Phoenix Fire, The Turn, Clearwater Way, and Steptoe Butte. Since 2002, he has been co-editor with Michael McDowell of Windfall, a journal of poetry of place which features poetry of the Pacific Northwest and appears twice yearly on the equinoxes. Here is Bill Siverly. As Mark said, I've, I've got five books of poetry, but I have a sixth one coming out in March called Nightfall. And uh, so I thought tonight I would read poems from that book called Nightfall. Um, Sounds grim, but not everything in it is grim. <laughs> As one gets on later in life, uh, one begins thinking about end, end game and end things. So decline and uh, hopefully not fall, but at least some kind of uh, coming to the uh, end of the, st of the second half of life. Is... But there's a lot positive going on. And the first poem I want to read is called November Home. It's a love poem for my wife, Jutta Donat, who's sitting over here. Um, written in 2012, actually. Fog hangs in the branches, veiling yellow maple leaves. Above damp ground, wood smoke adds its caustic bite to fog. Grown daughters with their miseries of loneliness and marriage pause briefly in the driveway, and then fly off on their long migrations. Alone at last, we spend the afternoon nesting in bed. We find refuge in old marriage, coming home from previous lives. Our hands of their own accord follow the intuition of skin, as if our bodies had known each other long before we met. Early darkness surrounds us like the breath of large animals. Eyes and thoughts shut down. We fly with unconscious abandon. Your archaic smile right after sex is always the same. Ancient wisdom shines in your eyes and hair like a winter moon as the pair of us glide to earth on synchronous wings. Rain returns like a revenant visitor peering in windows. It rains gently on the town, Rambo said in a previous life. Time transforms everything, but in our hands, time comes to a standstill like the chime of a clock at one. Mist hovers in the evergreens, then drifts away on autumn winds. Against the damp chill, we light a fire under a fir log. We read and talk and savor autumnal peace, karma complete. We have found what it means to live on earth. <laughs> Woman came up to me after I read that once and said, I wish somebody had written a poem like that to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> it works. Uh, here's a poem uh, Mark mentioned. I'm from Idaho, and so I grew up uh, fishing on the rivers in Idaho. I would have been probably 13, 12 or 13 when this poem takes place in Idaho County, Idaho, on the Locksaw River, which uh, goes up over the hill into Montana, if you were to follow it to the end. 
So, all along the green lock saw, trout stopped rising for flies. Dad and Bob decided to try their luck downriver, leaving the kid on the bank where they had parked the car. The kid clambered down the rocks to the turbulent lock saw. After a few casts and no strikes, the kid grew bored. He started to dandle the hackle on the surface of the pool, a fathomless eddy just in front of his feet. He played the decoy like an injured moth, twisting and flopping on the water. From deep within the pool, a very large rainbow rises, casually roils the water, seizes the fly, and dives out of sight. Just so, the present moment rises before us and disappears into our days. The thrill of hooking fish almost pulls the rod from his hands. Fighting all the way, he hauls the rainbow flopping on the rocks. The kid was amazed he caught the trout without even casting. Surely the gods of fishing would punish such idle dabble. Sure enough, he got no strikes the rest of the afternoon. But he was more than happy with the 14-incher and his creel. The kid could hardly wait for Dad and Bob to see his catch. He was waiting by the car when they trudged back with empty creels. They said no fish were biting today, but when they saw the kid's enormous trout, their eyes grew green as the lock saw rushing below. <laughs> Here's a California poem, sort of. It's part of it is, anyway. Mark, I appreciate that. Uh, there was a man in California in the 1960s named Arthur Piver. And Art Piver was uh, a genius at designing boats, especially catamarans and trimer trimerans. And all of the uh, trimeran fanatics in California thought Art Piver was God. <laughs> and uh, so he was really... Uh, influential. He only comes in to the very end of the poem. Um, and also the end of the poem, the, most of the poem takes place in the present, but the end goes back to 1965, when I would go out on San Francisco Bay with a friend of mine in a 17-foot catamaran and go blasting around the bay. When you get under the Golden Gate Bridge, the wind is coming through at such a ferocious <laughs> at a pace that you are... Uh, yes, right that you just blast along on the, on the bay. So, this is called, a poem called Care. It's also about climate change. A pileated woodpecker hammering the hollow cedar branch reminds me of Das Boot, when the submarine has run too deep. Rivets pop out and fall like chips, and the crew strains to hear the point when the craft that sustains them fails. Every March, Gabriel, now nine, plants maestro bush bees with me. I ask if he remembers how. He squats on the board along the row. He puts each pea one inch deep, three inches from the last one. I tell him growing food will be the one skill he can fall back on. In uncertain times, you feel like someone who harbors a secret most can't afford to confront. Climate change has tipping points. When you wake up to the crisis end of a nightmare, you can only hope to slow the momentum of decline, to give your posterity time, time to restrain relentless consuming, time to live on Earth's terms. Later in March, Julia and I plant russet narcota potatoes. I ask if she remembers how. She squats on the board along the row. She pushes seed spuds six inches deep, ten inches or more apart. I tell her growing food will be what she re most remembers from age 12. A hectic wind from the Golden Gate picks up Tate's catamaran like a leaf. 
Tate and I lean back on the healing hull and skim the bay on pure exhilaration. Skillful mariner and boat builder Art Piver designed a trimaran called Lodestar. Sailing solo from San Francisco, Piver disappeared in the vastness of the sea. You trying to sail from San Francisco to San Diego solo in one of the busiest shipping lanes on the West Coast. It is not going to be good. Um, my wife has been working on her memoirs. Uh, Yuta and her family fled communist East Germany in uh, 1953 and uh, 52, excuse me. And uh, so she has been working her way back there and we have gone back many times. And this last year, 2016, we spent three months in Germany uh, researching her memoirs and I was getting tons of material for writing poetry <laughs> at the same time. So. Uh, my German is very bad, but hers is exquisite, so <laughs> we managed to get along. Um, this is a poem about going to a concert in a, in a town called Hoyerschwerda, which is sort of a remote little town in eastern Germany. And uh, there's mention of a Skoda, if any of you ever seen the car called a Skoda, right? They're uh, common in Europe. They're a made, it's a Czech, Czech car from the Czech Republic, but it's made with Audi parts <laughs> and Volkswagen parts, right? And so, but it's a fancy, fancy car, and the top of the line is called the Superb. Isn't that a great line, top name for the top of the line? The Superb. So this is a poem called uh, Leaving Hoyer Schwerde After Nightfall. The communists converted this backwater town to coal extraction, building big boxy apartment blocks to house imported workers. After reunification, coal withdrew and workers moved away. Immigrants arrived, but xenophobic riots drove them out. Though immigrants are welcome now, nothing, not even converting open pit mines to lakes for farming fish, can stay Horia Schwerda's long decline from the heyday of coal, not even the culture factory, the last big box to go. There we joined descendants of Sorbish and German miners to hear Wolfram Huschke play his electric cello in solo concert. Screeching strings and tsunamis of sound broke the hairs in our inner ears as doctors warned about rock concerts in the 60s. I took out my hearing aids and covered my ears with my hands. Christian and his cellist son Henry grinned with musical delight. After the show, we sat back in Christian's black Skoda, superb, and rolled on country roads through slumbering towns and farms where feeble street lamps tried to fend off darkness and time. Inside the Skoda's warm hum, I heard a silence vast as a starry night, the silence of work running out, the silence of growing older now, the silence of mortality revealed in sleepless hours, the silence of doubt that foreshadows in each new beginning its end. <laughs> While we were in the, living in this town on the very eastern edge of Germany, uh, there's the nicer river that flows through it and uh, splits the town from the Polish side. And so we were over in Poland for a while visiting people and here some friends of ours uh, had built a house on seven acres 
out in the Polish countryside near the town of Luban. And Luban was uh, interesting from the uh, Second World War. Um, right in March 1945, right, two months from the end of the war, uh, the Soviets came rolling in and they took the tank battle, they took the town of Luban. However, the last, the last successful battle by the Wehrmacht, the German army, was to take the town back, <laughs> right, with a tank battle. And they held it for two months till the end of the war. <laughs> but that was the last successful battle by the Wehrmacht in World War II. And uh, so Luban was, uh, was sort of the last stand. And Utah's hometown is called Gerlitz. And it's about 21 kilometers uh, east of uh, east of Luban, and Luban's destruction, even though it happened twice, right? It was destroyed twice. Luban's destruction prevented the same thing happening to Gerlitz. So, was, and Gerlitz is a city that has never been bombed. So, when you're walking down a street in Gerlitz, you're looking back into the time of Shakespeare, right? in the six, 1600s. It's an amazing place. But here, we're in Poland, and the place is called A House on the Edge of the Forest. March 1945, the Wehrmacht drove the Soviets out of Luban. Tank battles reduced whole buildings to broken walls, as they had done after Hussites burned the down, town down twice. Survivors in Luban climbed out of the ruins to rebuild. On three hectares of meadow in the old Hochwald Chausse, Stefan and Katarzyna in 2012 began to build a Polish chateau. They are raising four daughters who love the trampoline. Carolina, the oldest one, does backflips off bales of hay. Katarzyna bakes and Stefan cooks. Their neighbor shot a young wild boar and Stefan marinated a leg for three days. Eight of us dined at the generous table, drinking Stefan's fine red wine. May we live long enough to taste again such savory wild boar. Katarzyna serves cheesecake, and Stefan pours frosty bekarovka. So, spicy little after-dinner drink. From the veranda, we watch two storks circle the la and land far afield. Stefan has mowed a 400-meter track where Katarzyna and kids can run. He tells how more storks follow his mower to catch the snakes. The storks who just landed in the sunshine spread their wings. Katarzyna ignores the squabbles of her daughters upstairs. Stefan says, the conflict would be settled before she could get there. As shadows spread the end of day across the meadow, we tell in quiet voices how we dwell and build and play. Um, back into the U.S. of A. here in Portland. A poem called Howling Wind. Has anybody ever threatened to kill you? That's a great, uh, <laughs> a great experience. <laughs> One I don't recommend. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I heard a poet fantasize how at some other poet's reading, he reached into his knapsack, pulled out a gun, and shot the poet because his poems were so bad, and he didn't even know it. The audience howled with delight, like the laugh track for a sitcom. It struck me then that no one had threatened to kill any of them. <laughs> Just last month, the ex-con lover of our daughter beat her up again. 
and this time he promised if the law came after him, he would kill her mother and me. He claimed he could firebomb our house at night, and flames would move so fast we would never know what hit us. We spent a very long month looking over our shoulders and peering through the window blind until the law caught up with him and put him in jail. Then last night I was awakened by my dog's low growls. Neighborhood coyotes were howling back at howling winds. As I got up to read for an hour before my second sleep, lights flashed and the power went out. I sat in dark, darkness, listening to the wind hurl branches against the house. As absolute darkness assumed its dominion over time, it struck me again how darkness outside rushes to join darkness within. The very enormity of it fills the night like wind until we turn and face our fear of the dangerous one. Full moon in November. This is after our last election. <laughs> and after this poem, I started to get more political, so I have to put up with that. <laughs> Full moon in November, 14th of November, 2016. The moon rises like fate, unseen behind a cloudy sky. November descends over my life, and chilly, rainy air storms in. I turn 73, embraced at home by all three generations of my clan. The sum of their affection keeps me warm. Otherwise, I withdraw from the world, world's dust like Tao Qian, retiring to ancestral fields overgrown with weeds, awaiting his calm cultivation. His inward focus on the way invites the great transformation to happen of its own accord. Though alpen glow prevails when we enter Marikara woods, November darkness falls in half an hour. Like losers after the liar's election, leaves tumble into winter's narrow house. November maples are bare, and no humans walk the trails. My headlamp moon draws bats who fly at my face and veer off. The gods withdraw into hibernation, and only they know where. Rulers fail to learn how empires end. Under hoarfrost of resignation, I turn away from them. I dwell on my inner garden and friends, allowing the great transformation to happen of its own accord. Yuta and I behold the full moon from a Vancouver parking lot, the moon clear, crisp, and cold as night air in November. We share solace at day's end beside the fire in our hearth. We shelter kids who celebrate each other and the world. After, <laughs> after, after this, this election was such a shock, <laughs> that's about the most I could come up with at the time. Um, I'd like to end with a poem called Who Owns the World? Um, this will be the first poem in the book. Um, Bertolt Brecht. Uh, somebody familiar with him as a famous playwright, mostly a German playwright. Uh, maybe you've heard of his greatest play, Mother Courage and Her Children. It's a fantastic play, or uh, if you can ever find a tape of it, by all means, see it. Um, and Bertolt Brecht also was a scriptwriter early on, and he, he participated in a f writing a film called Kula Vampa. And it's kind of explained in this poem. 
Who Owns the World? In 1932, Bertolt Brecht posed this question in Kula Vampa, a film about the unemployed homeless who camped beside a lake called Grosser Mugelze. Kula Vampa is Berlin's slang for empty belly. Nazis destroyed the campsites in 1934. Nowadays, the hungry and the homeless roam the world in leaky boats and broken shoes, seeking refuge under razor wire, camping in burned-out borderlands. Nowadays, Germany welcomes refugees with food, a place to sleep and work. The rich think they own the world, and the outspoken are wiped out by surveillance, by secret police, by drones. Survivors go silent, and silence owns the world. But silence is not human, and when the ruling class collapses, outspoken survivors think they own the world. May Day 2017 in Portland, anarchists in black ski masks break windows and start fires in the street. They know an unsustainable system has to fall. Cops in black helmets, herd them along with truncheons and flash grenades. To answer Breck's question, no one owns the world. Air, water, and light go everywhere like refugees. In truth, the world owns us, and to this truth we owe our lives. When people have forgotten this, we live in dark times. Thank you.